All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. For those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here at Aletheia. Um, Before we dive into the scriptures and into the sermon for today, as you're probably aware, we've experienced multiple shootings over the past um, two to three weeks, and I imagine you, like I am, grieved by it, saddened by it. And in Jeremiah 20, um, God tells his people through the prophet Jeremiah to seek the peace of the city that they're in. And the city that they were in at the time was Babylon. And who knows what kind of inju- you know, injustice and things that grieve God's heart were going on in Babylon. So what did God tell them to do? To seek the peace of that city. And one of the ways to seek that is through prayer. So I want to take just a moment before we dive into the scriptures and pray for our nation and pray for this injustice to stop. So Heavenly Father, um, what we've seen happening around our nation this week, Lord, just the terrible, grievous, ugly, evil, wicked things going on. Lord, we run to you and we pray for your peace over our land. Lord, we pray that these shootings would stop. We pray that uh, justice would be done and that this wickedness would be uprooted. Lord, we pray for your peace over our nation. Lord, would you give your comfort to these families who've been affected? Um, Lord, would you be a salve to wounds? And uh, would this, as hard as it is for us to see how it could possibly do so, would this serve to glorify you ultimately? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, kind of connected to that, today we're finishing up our series, Image and Identity. And what we've discovered in the scriptures is that human beings bear the image of God. And it is that very fact that gives them value. So I think it's fitting today that we're focusing once again on the subject of image and identity. So over the past however many weeks it's been, I forget, I don't know, six, seven weeks, we've discovered some interesting things about what it means to be truly human. That to be truly human fundamentally is to be an imager of God. Then we also learn that it means to be a saved sinner, to be a new creation, to be an individual who is in community, and to be like an integrated whole person. Now, all those things are pretty amazing gifts from God to us through Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you've picked up on this. I've kind of seen this theme recurring time and again in these passages, is that image and identity for somebody who follows Jesus is much more about holding on to what you already have in Christ. It's not going after something that you don't yet have. It's saying, oh, no, this, like, I've been given this gift of a new identity by sheer grace from God through Jesus Christ. So as we wrap up today, I, wanna, I want us to look at what, how, how do we live from that identity day in, day out, refusing to let go of it. So to do that, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13. That's 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 13. If you're following along in a Bible app, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version translation, so if you select that translation, you'll be able to to follow along word for word. The scripture will also be up on the screen, so feel free to follow along there. Beginning in verse 1, I'll read for us, we'll pray, and then we'll dive in. Verse 1. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise." We are treated as impostors, 
and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that he would guide us in it today. Heavenly Father, we've been meditating together on the amazing gift of a new identity we have in Christ. Today, would you help us hold on to it, to endure and to live from that identity every day of our lives so that you might be glorified. Lead and guide us by your Spirit in your Scriptures today. In Jesus' name, amen. In meditating on this passage, uh, a story came to mind. I was speaking to my parents a couple weeks ago, and they told me about this very funny interaction that they had. They went to see a new, uh, what's it called, a financial advisor, that's it. And they, so the new financial advisor was kind of looking over their finances, and she came across the portion where it outlines like what they give. And my parents give a tenth of their income, 10%, to their church, and then they give over and above towards church planting and missions and compassion ministries. And the lady like stopped and she pointed out, she's like, what are you doing? (laughs) Like, why do you do this? So my parents explained why they do that. And she looked at, at them as if they were like weird exotic zoo animals that she had never encountered in her life. Because in the city where my parents live, The race that everybody is running, the game everybody is playing, is early retirement. It's 55, and you retire, and then you do what you want. So as this woman sees what my parents do with their finances, she's like, why would you intentionally lose the game? (laughs) Why would you forfeit the race? And what my parents had to explain to her in different words was like, no, we're, we're playing a different game. We're running a different race. She looked at them as if they were crazy, but yet she still continued to help them. Um, Here's the thing about Paul. Maybe you notice that there's a bit of tension in the way that he writes to the Corinthians. And both in in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, there's there's some beef there that you can sense. It's because the Corinthians thought Paul was a bit of a loser. They had been convinced of this, that Paul wasn't a very impressive person. He showed up, he was poor, he supported himself through manual labor, and by his own admission, he wasn't an impressive public speaker. Now, in Corinth, this was a big deal. Big, uh, like major famous orators would come through Corinth, and they would speak, and they'd be wealthy and impressive, and they'd have these amazing, eloquent words, and people would be impressed by them. And so some people had kind of weaseled their way into the Corinthian church and convinced them that Paul was a loser because he didn't look like those people. And Paul has to write to them and say, "Uh, we're playing a different game. We're running a different race. And here's the interesting thing. Every culture in every generation wants to define its losers and its winners. And that's true in your cultural circles as well. Sometimes it's along socioeconomic lines that winning or losing depends on the amount of money you do or don't have in your bank account. Sometimes it's along lines of status and notoriety. If you go to apply for a new job and the person reads down the list and there's no like noteworthy school or noteworthy accomplishment, well, you're losing in life. Sometimes it's along the lines of family expectations, that if you don't take up the family mantle or the family business, or fall in line with like what your family expects you to do, you're a loser. And everybody, you, know, you get together with your family, maybe at reunions, and everybody's like, yeah, that's that cousin, the loser. And here's what can make it hard to live from the image and the identity you have in Christ, is sometimes winning in that realm is going to look like losing according to the world. 
And consistently, you're going to face the same pressure that the Corinthians faced, which was to say, uh, I'd, I'd rather win in the game everybody else is playing. And so Paul writes to them. He says, no, 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 I want to remind you what the real game is, what the real race is, and I want to help you stay that course, stay that race. And here's what I think we learn in this passage, is that when living for Jesus looks like losing to the world, we must look, at, we, we stay the course by looking at the victory of Jesus. So in your life, when living for Jesus looks like losing to the world, we stay the course by looking at the victory of Jesus. Let's unpack that a little bit. So Paul starts out, and he writes to them, and he begins by saying, working together with him then. Who's him? It's, it's God. In the previous chapter, he has just talked about how God is bringing this cosmic renewal project into the world. We actually looked at a little bit of it a couple weeks back when we, when, when we studied the passage that says, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. He then goes on to say, not only is a person a new creation in Christ, God through Jesus is actually renewing everything. This is God's plan with the world. Renewal. And what does he say? We, those who follow Jesus, get to work with God in that pursuit. Now this is a pretty, like Paul is wanting to get their attention and say, look at what we get to do with God. And he's going to later talk about the sacrifices he made, but in light of what he gets to do, he's like, yeah, those sacrifices totally make sense. It's a little bit like, you know, if you're pursuing a certain career, sometimes you get to intern, right? And many times, internship means you don't get paid much, if anything at all. Um, you, you work, you know, 70, 80 hours a week for nothing. But why? It's to maybe get to work at that company, or get to, work, get, get to clerk for that judge, or get to work for that, 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 that firm, that it is the, uh, the opportunity to get to work in that area that justifies the sacrifice. And Paul's like, what could be better than working with God in what he calls earlier the ministry of reconciliation? Reconciling all things to himself. That's what God is doing, and we get to work with him in that. Are you kidding me? Why are you playing these power games? Why are you playing these status games? We get to work with him in it. We are like that's what living for Jesus is all about. Now, sometimes I'm not as excited about that as I should be. Maybe you feel the same way. And maybe if you're honest, like I'm honest, some mornings I wake up and the idea of living my life for the ministry of reconciliation doesn't sound too exciting. And I'd rather seek some other pursuits. I'd rather win at some other games in life. Anybody else feel like that sometimes? Yeah? Okay. I'm in good company then. The rest of you are lying. But that's, that's okay. Um, so what do we do? Here's, here's how you know. Um, what am I trying to say? When it feels that way... Here's an interesting experience that maybe you've felt in your own life. When you want to win at other games, there's a way in which satisfaction and fulfillment is out there, over that hill, on the other side of that experience, on the other side of that job. It puts satisfaction and fulfillment on the other side of whatever the goal is of the race you're going to run. But look at what Paul says to them. So he quotes from Isaiah. He says in verse 2, he says, In a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Then he says, Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. The, the initial prophecy points forward to a time when God would visit his people and do something extraordinary. And Paul is saying, The time is here. The time has come, and he calls it salvation. This is the day of salvation. Now, here's how these two things match up. We might not use the word salvation, but oftentimes when it comes to running worldly races, salvation is the goal. Salvation meaning, like, call it whatever you want, meaning, purpose, self-actualization, fulfillment, satisfaction, 
All those words could be summed up in the word salvation in this life. And Paul wants to get their attention and say, hey, in Jesus, salvation is here. If you have Christ, not only do you have everything you could ever need, you have everything you could ever want. But when you're tempted to run other races, it says, oh, no, no, salvation is there. And it's funny, isn't it? No matter how much you run down that track, salvation seems always to be there. On the other side of that next raise, on the other side of that next experience, on the other side of that next vacation, that next relationship, there is an elusiveness about satisfaction Why? Because salvation is never meant to be found in those things. There's nothing wrong with career. God loves careers. He made you like good at work so that you'd be good at work. But if we try and tap salvation from those things, it will always be elusive. Paul reminds them, in Jesus, you have that meaning you're actually looking for. And what does meaning mean? You know, we use the word meaning a lot. Meaning is a combination of purpose and significance. Purpose. I feel like my life matters. Like I know where I'm going. I feel like I know what I'm meant to do with this body and this mind and this soul. Yes, I know what I'm supposed to do. And significance is like, I matter. Paul says, in life, you have that in Christ. It's not out there. It's here. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the favorable time. And living for Jesus might look like losing to the world, but the good news of the gospel is that when you have Jesus, you have the best thing possible. The best thing possible. Then he starts talking about staying the course. So when, winning, when living for Jesus looks like losing to the world, how then do we stay the course? Because he starts talking about endurance, all the things that he has endured. And here, maybe on a Sunday morning, you know, I'm talking about Jesus being the best thing in life, and you're stoked, you're like, yes, living for Jesus. Come Thursday morning, you're like, I don't know, (laughs) I really need to get to small group, I need to be refueled and reminded. Yeah, that's why group is awesome, you should be part of a small group. Um, But like, how do you day in, day out endure and live from this place of imageness in God? Well, he says this, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. What is he saying there? He says, as we're living this life as new creations in Christ, we commit to do two things. Not put a, stumb- not, not put a stumbling block in anybody's way and to commend ourselves in, in every way. What's he talking about? He's talking about backing up the claim, uh, yeah, with your life, backing up the claim that Jesus is better. That living for Christ is the ultimate and best possible race you could ever run. He says, we don't want to put a stumbling block in anybody's way, and we want to commend ourselves. Here's what I thought about when, when I read those verses. Why are we so shocked when f- well-known Christian leaders fail morally? And just a quick asterisk, we should be very humble and slow to point fingers at those people because you and I are just as... Uh, prone to greed and lust as any of the, they're human beings and so are we. So it's not like a how, how could you? It's like, oh, human beings, of course. But why are we so shocked? Nobody looks at a leader in the business world who fails morally and is like, like they're just absolutely shocked. Like, are you kidding me? The CEO had an affair? Like, that's not a usual thing you hear. But What about when a famous Christian leader does it? And here's why I think it's so scandalous and so jarring to us. Because that's a person who stands up week after week and says, Jesus is the best possible thing. 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 And then you find out that they're living life as if money is the best possible thing. As if sex is the best possible thing. As if something else is the best possible thing. And we see that... what, what is that? That's a stumbling block. That people look at those instances and say, how can Jesus be the, pe- the, the best possible thing if the people who claim to be professional Jesus followers live as if Jesus is not the best possible thing? 
And Paul says, we are not about doing that. No, no, no. We need to stay the course. We need to live the kind of lives that actually say that Jesus is the best possible thing. Now, how do they do that? Like, what what does that look like in their day-to-day life? Well, he talks about a couple things. He says in verse 4, As servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance. So he starts talking about endurance, and then he lists off what they endure. Afflictions, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights. So he first talks about endurance. And it's interesting, reading over that list, I, I have never experienced a physical beating for Christ or imprisonment or riots. And yet, to sign up to follow Jesus and to do so diligently means you're going to receive opposition. In our own, like, in my family's life, so I work for a church. You probably knew this, you know, seeing as how I'm standing here. But it's interesting, when, when, when we started this church and we started meeting every Sunday and doing the whole worship gathering thing as a church, our Saturday afternoons and evenings became like spiritual battlefields. And at first, I thought, gosh, we're, like, we're doing our Saturdays wrong. I must adjust my schedule. You know, we, we must do different activities. And then, I don't know, like 18 months later, I realized, oh, <laughs> the devil hates churches and hates people proclaiming the gospel, hates people gathering together and encouraging one another, all the more as Jesus' approach nears, of course, spiritual op- opposition. And some people might say to me, like, Why would you sign up for that? I'd be like, well, you know, let's think back to our internship example. Yeah, sleepless nights and that difficulty for the opportunity to proclaim the gospel and for there to be a group of Jesus followers who gather to encourage one another to live the kind of lives that are like spotlights for the kingdom of God. Yeah, it's worth it. And here's the thing, I've spoken to many of you, and when you signed up not just to follow Jesus, but like to lead something, and like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to like make disciples. And the devil just brought a whole mess of garbage into your life. It was surprising at first, but it's so cool to hear your stories. And like, yeah, I, God has given you all the resources necessary to resist the devil so that he must flee. And you're engaged in a battle. And somebody else might look at your life and think, why would you live like that? Like, why would you willing take, like willingly receive spiritual opposition in your life? Well, it's because of what we get to do. <laughs> It's because this is the ministry of reconciliation. It's because God is bringing the entire cosmos under his authority. Like, what could be better than that? What could be better than it? So he talks about endurance. And then he starts talking about conduct. He says in verse 6, By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech. Paul wants people to be able to look at his life and the life and and the lives of his colleagues and not to be able like to see genuine Christ-like character on display. And notice this character is through honor or dishonor, through slander and praise. That they are going to act with genuine Christ-like character even in the midst of not being the recipients of Christ-like character. When you live like that, it backs up the claim of the gospel that Jesus is better. When in your classroom, when everybody is, or maybe in your industry, when everybody is kind of like padding their resumes, it's kind of like you know uh, boosting the sales right towards the end of the quarter just to make it look a little more impressive, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to live with integrity I'm going to represent things truthfully as they actually are. Some people might say, you're losing the race if you do that. And Paul would say, no, 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 you're commending people to the gospel. You're showing them that Jesus is actually better. You don't have to act dishonestly. In your your classroom, um, among fellow students, when there's so much pressure to act in a certain way and for... and to normalize certain things, and even though it's very unpopular, you say, you know what, I'm going to stick with the Scriptures. You are commending the gospel to them. You're showing them that Jesus is actually better. So, they talk about endurance, talks about conduct, and then I love this third one, and we can't forget this third one, okay? Because maybe as you were hearing about, like, conduct 
and endurance, you're thinking, wow, that sounds exhausting. But the third thing he talks about is spiritual power. Look at this. He says, by purity, knowledge, kindness, the Holy Spirit, by truthful speed, and the power of God, with weapons for the right hand and for the left. I love this. Paul says, look, there's no world in which we could live the kind of lives that back up the claim of the gospel unless we had the power of God. And it is only the power of God by the Holy Spirit that we're, we're able to live that kind of life. It's not going to be you pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's going to be you relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's how you live a life that commends the gospel. That's how you stay the course. So here's the good news. When you wake up in the morning and you, like I, feel like running different races for security, for wealth, for satisfaction, for fame, but you say, God, I'm going to rely on you. The power of God by the Holy Spirit comes into your life and is the very power you need to stay the course. This is why I read my Bible and pray in the morning. Yes, I'm a morning person. I love the mornings. They're the best time of... No? Okay. Mornings are awesome, but also, just to be honest, I wake up wanting to run like every race except the living for Christ race. I wake up and I am just a dumpster fire of idolatry waiting to happen. And I have to get up, brew some coffee, and then get in the scriptures immediately to remind myself Jesus is better. The ministry of reconciliation is worth the sacrifice. What could be better than co-laboring with Christ in Him bringing all things under the authority of God? Wow. Wow. Yeah, but somebody just unfriended me, you know, because I follow Jesus. Yeah, okay, that's fine. It's worth it. When living for Jesus looks like losing to the world, we must stay the course. The question is how? Yes, the power of God, but there's something more. I love this next section, and it shows us that we stay the course by looking at the victory of Jesus. I love how this next section just, it's brilliant. So in verse 8, uh, Yes, the second half of verse 8. He starts giving these contrasts, separated by the word as. He says things like this, We are treated as impostors and yet are true. So there's this perception that we're impostors, but the reality is that we're true. He continues, As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As punished, yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. And this has to be one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. There's a perception that we have nothing. And he's just described what that perception is. That we're poor, that we're unimpressive. That we're not winning all of the games and the races that everybody is playing. It looks like we have nothing And yet, we possess everything. What's he talking about? Because he has Christ, Paul's like, I have everything. I have everything. With that paradigm, let's go back through. We're treated as imposters and yet are true. Sometimes being a Christian can feel like you're on the outside looking in. Like you don't belong. Like, yeah, you don't. The world is not your home. Why? Because heaven is. We live as punished and yet are not killed. There's this amazing thing. Just when you think you've experienced as much spiritual opposition as you can take, the Holy Spirit comes in and just like lifts you up on your feet. Gives you a whole new level of power. Somebody speaks a word into your life and spiritual power just comes rushing in. And you feel like, yeah, I can live for God. I love this, this one. As poor, yet making many rich. This is so cool. Paul says, like, yeah, I'm doing manual labor to support myself. Not only am I rich, but through us, God is making many rich. He's making many rich. We look like we don't have anything, yet we possess everything. What's he talking about? Like, what? This, this is a weird way to think, okay? I don't know. Maybe... Maybe it doesn't sound as weird to you as it sounds to me, but to talk like this and to think like this is weird unless he had a reason for it. 
And for Paul, the paradigm for his life is another person's life, the life of Jesus Christ. And as Paul recounts these things, it is clear that he has Jesus Christ in mind. And here's what I mean. I've got a picture here. Um, Yeah. Here, I think, illustrates the point. This is a cross. And in Jesus' day, and in Paul's day, nothing could have been more of a representation of loss and defeat than the cross. It was dehumanizing. It was, the lo- it was the most dehumanizing punishment that the Romans could come up with. And Roman citizens couldn't even be crucified because it was so dehumanizing. Like you were the lowest of the low, the absolute scum, the absolute dregs if you were cru- crucified. And Jesus Christ was crucified. It looked when Jesus hung on the cross as if he had lost everything. That his was a story of total defeat and loss. That he'd come into the world and, great, he'd done some signs, he'd lived this life, and then he lost everything and died, penniless. His last human possession, his robe, gambled away by Roman soldiers. And yet, we know it because we wear this as jewelry around our necks, tattooed on our arms, put it on the steeples of our churches. This is the very thing that signifies his victory. It appears as loss, and yet it is victory. It appears at, as defeat, and yet it is the very avenue through which God was bringing absolute triumph into the world. And so Paul has this in mind, and he says, all this loss, all this that looks like defeat, no, 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 this is victory coming through. When we keep this in mind, when we look at Jesus' victory, that's how we stay the course. How then do we respond to this passage? got three simple things to give you when we think about putting this into practice. First, recognize the signs. Paul gives us some ways to think about our own lives. He says, look, if this is going on in your life, you might be running the wrong race. How do we know if we're running the wrong race or the right race? Like, how do we know if we're living for Jesus or for other things? Here are three diagnostic questions that we can ask ourselves. One, are you experiencing worldly discontentment or satisfaction in Christ? In your day-to-day life, is it characterized by discontentment or satisfaction in Christ? I'm not saying don't have life goals. I'm not saying don't have desires that you'd love God to bring through. But if there's a constant state and a constant undertow of discontentment, God has better for you. He wants you to have satisfaction in Christ. The realization, the the This kind of tone from Paul, it's like, if I've got Christ, I've got everything. That's what God wants for you. Here's the second question. Are you affectionate toward other disciples or alienated from them? This might seem strange, but notice in verses 11 through 13, he writes to them, he says, look, you've got beef with us. Widen your heart. (laughs) He says, look, this animosity is not godly. It means you're running the wrong race. It means you're invested in the wrong thing. In your own life, do you notice kind of alienation from the people of God, from other disciples? God has better for you. When you're living for Jesus, there is going to be a love for and affection toward his followers that breaks all the categories, socioeconomic, ethnic, all of those usual barriers that stand up against us having relationship with other people in Christ, those come down. And I love the fact that we have a church that is multi-ethnic, that is socioeconomically diverse, generationally diverse. Do you realize only Jesus can do this? Like this is not normal. To sit in a room that is diverse along all these different lines. We didn't do this. Jesus did this. You living for Jesus has done this. So recognize the signs. Here's the third question that you can ask. Does your life underscore or undermine the value of the gospel? Does your life underscore or undermine the, the, the value of the gospel? Are there things in your life right now that if somebody was to find them out, it would discredit the gospel? Deal with those things. Repent of them. They're not worth keeping around. Christ is better. And here's the cool thing. 
We tell ourselves every week, we exist to make disciples, right? You do that through the verbalized gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, absolutely. But do you realize like your life is like supporting evidence for that? That as you're just living your life for Jesus, people are watching you. And they're saying, hmm, maybe Jesus is better (laughs) than fame. Maybe Jesus is better than the pursuit of wealth. Maybe Jesus is better than notoriety and status and all these things that other people run after. When they watch you valuing, relishing Jesus Christ, it's a testament to them about Jesus. So those are some questions that can help you recognize the signs. The second one is walk the talk. Endure. Live the kind of life that people, well, we just talked about this, that people look at and it supports the gospel. And then here's the third simple application. Widen your heart. This is what Paul tells them to do. Widen your heart, he says. He tells them in verse 12, you have an affection problem. He says, you're limited in your your affections. What's he talking about? They're loving the wrong thing too much and not the right thing. And he points them to Jesus Christ to point them to the very object of what their affection should be. And I think the thing at core that has the ability to help you live for Jesus and to stay the course over the long term is to consistently return with your heart and your affections to Jesus Christ. Let's put that picture of the cross back up. I think when you return here, this is how you widen your heart. Because you realize that Jesus went through all of that for us. Paul talks about riots, imprisonments, beatings. Jesus Christ was betrayed by a close friend, arrested, subjected to mock trials, the victim of injustice, thorn, a, a crown of thorns driven into his head, a cat of nine tails laid upon his back and then crucified on a cross. What Paul experienced, Jesus experienced to the absolute ultimate degree. And yet he lived the kind of life that testified to the truthfulness of the gospel. Paul was great, but I'm sure he didn't get it right all the time. And we won't, and yet Jesus did. But he still took a cross. And he did it so that you and I might live for him, might have this amazing treasure of the gospel. I think when we return to this day after day after day about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, our affections will turn toward him and we'll realize the value of knowing and loving Christ and we'll stay the course by looking at his victory. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what good news. We thank you that Jesus is better. Lord, we declare that right now as a church. Jesus is better. Jesus is not only everything we need, but everything we could ever want. Lord, the greatest fulfillment of our hopes and our dreams. Lord, in Christ, we have what we could never earn for ourselves. And we're so grateful. Lord, it's hard to remember this day after day when there are so many other games and races vying for our attention, but we just bring ourselves back to the cross of Jesus Christ and we remember that living for Jesus is the best possible thing in the world. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. I pray that they would know how to respond to this passage, that you would give them the courage to do so. Lord, we want to glorify Jesus In our lives, we want our lives individually and as a church to be evidence for the claim that Jesus is better. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.